to a well-designed business. My name is Luann Nigara, and I'm so glad you found this podcast. Together with my husband, Vince, and our partner, Bill, we have grown our company, Window Works, from the ground up. So I know and I understand the challenges you face in running your interior design business. I also know that your talent alone isn't enough to ensure your success. So on this podcast, we talk about strategies and practical steps to help you grow your business. But make no mistake about it, we have our share of fun here too, mixed in with those aha moments that I love so much. This isn't fluff. Nobody has time for that. Whether you are a new interior designer or a seasoned designer, I am here to help you create and to manage the kind of interior design firm that you dream of. It's straight talk and it's action. Are you ready? Let's get started. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday. On the show today, I have the co-founders of Bad Assery Magazine and the co-hosts of the Bad Assery Podcast. These women are Samantha Parker and Kathy Rasmussen. And these are two, like, take the world by the you-know-what women. They, um, together are creating a ridiculously passionate community of women that they support, of women entrepreneurs that are committed to living bold and passionate passionate filled lives and they are just uh they're, they're they're trailblazers and they are so real and so genuine in this mission and what's interesting is watching them doing it you can see that they're having a heck of a lot of fun while they do it because you know what they're being very true to who they are and the way they want to do it um and they're doing it with accolades too they have both been featured on now this the daily v bold tv they've been on numerous interviews and podcast. And um, I have to say, when you go through their website and everything, it is literally what we talk about all the time. Be exactly who you are. Don't show up on your website one way and then show up in an interview the other way. So you'll hear them in the interview today and they are just so uh, full of life, energetic, but really interested in living life on their terms. And there were two things I wanted to share with you from their website that I thought was pretty fun. You know, when you have a dictionary entry and it says, you know, table, colon, you know, top with four legs, whatever. So on their website, it says Samantha Parker, verb, cool female entrepreneur, changing the world by building a visible community and magazine, synonym, glitter bitch, risk taker, hikes in sparkly boots, CEO of kicking ass. And then for Kathy Rasmussen, it says, adjective, creative ninja, wine warrior, and community building artiste. It also says, you've been Rasmussen, i.e. exploded your business badassery, not to be confused with the Rasmussen popularity poll. Cinnamon, cinnamon, how do you like that? Synonym, kick-ass painter, sparkle, sass maker, CEO of awesome stuff. So I just love it. These women are real through and through. Now, the reason why I had them on the show, I wanted to share with you. They are experts at creating a community because they are doing it in their authentic way. You don't need to do it their way. You need to do it your way, okay? But they do have some great guiding principles on how to do it your way. Interestingly, we just had Nancy Halla on the show a couple of days ago, and she talked about her and Sherry Silata, how they have come up with their pillar life. Well, funny, by coincidence, I'm 100% sure, Samantha, and Kathy have brand pillars that they have identified in for their community and so that they create and attract the people who are like them and who will respond to them. And the thing that I want you to understand is, is that as an interior designer, you might be interested in com- creating a community for yourself. We have both Colleen Prim and Wendy Wallace Chuck who have done this in Facebook. So they each have community facing Facebook groups and they are both legitimately getting clients from it. Okay. So for instance, Window Works has a Facebook, but it doesn't have a Facebook group. Okay. I have not crossed over or had interest in creating people to g- just be in my closed group there at Window Works, okay? But both Colleen and Wendy have. And so therefore, they are 
giving information in a way that's authentic to them. And so, and it is resulting in business for them. So if you have aspirations to do this, then this is a great show to listen to because you're going to get some real solid tips and advice on how to do it in a way that is truly you and combines with some great principles on what to make sure to do when you actually set out to do this. Okay. So Reminder before we start this episode that we have our sponsor, Article.com. Article.com is your place for the sleek mid-century Scandinavian Scandinavian inspired design that you love. You can get sofas and chairs and office furniture, accessories, outdoor furniture, all through article.com. Here's the thing. You know what I love most about it. I love the furniture. I think it's beautiful. I love the clean look of it. That's all true. But what I love about it is that their trade program is run by interior designers. That was the thing when they originally came to me and asked me if they could sponsor the show. And when I was asking them about their company and the trade program and vetting it, that was one of the key things that I loved. You know, there's always one thing that I love more than others (laughs) with almost everything, right? And so... I love that in particular because we know what it's like when we need something by a certain date and somebody on the other end of the line just doesn't understand that it's Thanksgiving or it's Christmas or it's Hanukkah or it's New Year's or it's Valentine's Day or it's whatever it is and we have to have it. And so when you deal with people who have come from the industry, they get it. So if you are interested in setting up your trade account at Article, go over to welldesigned.article.com welldesigned.article.com now here's one thing i want to say to you i do not make money when you sign up for article.com when you sign up for cravit when you sign up for my doma studio okay but each of these brands and others have paid money to be sponsors of the show so Uh, If you are going to them because you found out about them from my show, it's really super important for me and I would value and appreciate the gesture so much if you did it through welldesigned.article.com. This way they know that the money they have invested to help me bring this show to you was well spent. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I cannot wait to introduce you to Samantha Parker and Kathy Rusmussen. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. It's Power Talk Friday, and I am very happy to introduce to you two people that are really do fit the the moniker Power Talk Friday. I have Samantha Parker and Kathy Rasmussen with me today, and they are the partners in the Bad Assery community. Hi, ladies. How are you? Great. Thank you so much for having us today. Yes, thank you so much. So I am pretty excited to talk to you ladies because you're doing something very significant. Um, what's, what I like is that you're doing it in a fun way and it comes off um, as all about the fun, which is awesome because it attracts it attracts me into your world and what you're doing. But the more you get in and the more you read about it and learn about what you're doing, uh, it is very significant work that you're doing in helping women. And I'm just going to share with everybody your what I read. You have a book out, the two of you, called Badassery Style Community, which I have read. You sent it to me, and I appreciate that very much. And here was the significant thing that stopped me in my tracks when I was reading the book. It says that we are a global community of women living unapologetic lives. We hold space for empowered women who are empowering those around them. We honor collaboration over competition, and we believe that we rise higher and more powerful together. And everything that I have looked into and researched with you two really seems to prove out this mission of yours. So first of all, congratulations. Um, second, tell me, one of you, start by telling why this is important to you and maybe a little backstory of how you came to start this badassery community almost three years ago now. Well, we kind of... 
started the community just out of the need to gather people. You know, if you have a business or you're starting a movement, like you've got to come in and gather people. But really the reason, like the big why behind it, and we got started in all of this was that we really wanted to change the dynamic of the way that women work together. And so we wanted to create a space where instead of it just being about us and what we can offer them, we wanted to really hear what those women could offer the world. So we literally just set out to build that. And you have done this through multiple um, platforms. You have the Badassery Magazine. You have the Badassery Podcast. You have your book, as I just mentioned. You have both a um, open uh, community, right, and a private paid community. So you have these different ways that you are bringing this message and this empowerment throughout um you know, and helping different women share this thing. Tell what what's a, what? Tell me a little bit about. Was there something in one or both of yours experience beforehand that prompted this, or did you just come to? How did you two meet? Let's go do that. It was kind of a fun story. We met at a conference. Um, in Salt Lake City, where I lived at the time, Samantha lives in southern Utah, so she came up um, to visit a mutual friend that we both have. And I was meeting our friend there at the event, and um, Samantha was there with her, and she introduced us. Um, and I found out that Samantha had just started a business as a social media manager, and I was um, I was kind of side hustling, so I had a full time job as an event planner. Um, actually, at the I was the private dining director at a local restaurant, and I was working on developing my own business as an idea implementation strategist at the same time. So we were at this conference trying to help us kind of learn how to grow our businesses <laughs> and learn how to have an online business. And so when we we met, it was great because she was a social media manager. I was having a hard time juggling like doing all the things for my business plus working full-time so I decided to hire her (laughs) soon as we got as soon as we got done with the conference I just sent her an email like I want to hire you I need a social media manager and um so yeah that was a fun thing that's interesting but I do have to go back one little bit there Kathy, what the heck is an idea implement, implementation strategist? I, it's, I've never heard this phrase before. Well, it's well, it, it's kind of what I determined what it was that I did. So I spent twelve years as an event planner, and all I it, kind of toward that time when I started growing my business a little bit. I realized that I approached every single event that I planned in the exactly the same way. And it didn't matter if it was a meeting for four people. It didn't matter if it was a wedding. Um, it doesn't matter if it was a corporate party for 2,500 people. I still had the same methodology that I used to plan every single event. And then I realized, because uh, I'm very analytical, <laughs> <laughs> I realized that I also do other things in my life the same way. If I have a project that I'm working on, if I have a goal that I want to achieve, if I have any type of idea that comes into my head that I want to bring to life, I approach it in exactly the same way that I plan events. And so I broke down this little system that I didn't even know that I used until Mm. it kind of hit me into different steps and I, when I started talking to other people about it, telling one of my best friends about it, she's like, that is so cool. Like this is, I, I need someone like you to help me because I have all these big ideas and these big visions, but I have no idea how to bring them to life. Mm. And so I'm like, ah, I did implementation strategy. <laughs> <laughs> that was how that started. And it was a great, it was a great time to do it because even though like I loved being an event planner and it was actually my dream job. Like I I dreamed of becoming an event planner and working my way up the ladder to become like my ultimate goal was to be a director, an Mm. event director at a, at a facility. And I got up there Mm. and, and, and after kind of the, the honeymoon period of it all wore off, I realized I was absolutely miserable doing Mm. it. And it was because I mean, it was because it wasn't really, I thought it would be like, I would be able to 
work toward my goals and being able to achieve what the vision that I saw for the department, but it ended up that it was more my boss's goals and the company and all they were concerned about was sales and numbers and, and they didn't care about <laughs> helping people, you know, make beautiful events and have all these experiences. They just wanted to see those dollars and it was draining and it was hard and it was not the reason I got into it. And so I'd find myself working these forever long days and so, sitting in the my car in the parking lot after, you know, a 14 hour day, my feet are throbbing, my head is pounding and I'm sobbing mm. because I'm so miserable and just thinking, why am I doing this to myself? Why mm. am I putting myself through this misery every single day? And that's when I decided that just starting my own business wasn't enough. I really needed to to leave my nine to five job and just work full time on my business. And when I decided to do that, it kind of changed everything for me. <laughs> so the big leap was scary as all get out, but you, you basically got to a brick wall and there was no choice. But when you got to that brick wall and you made your pivot into your own business, things started to click. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was not, I mean, it doesn't happen it, in a minute. I don't yeah, know. Exactly. No, 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 no. We all know it doesn't happen in a minute. <laughs> Everybody listening is an interior designer that's either just opened or in business 10 years, but we all know it doesn't happen in a minute. Don't worry. <laughs> so, okay. And so for your part, Sam, she reaches out and she says, would, you know, can I hire you to be my social media strategist? And then what happens? You, do you start to work together and then eventually there's a click and you just start to, I don't know, tell me how that happens. Yeah. Well, actually that conference she's speaking of, my friend took me because she was like, you're going to start this business <laughs> because I had just quit my job and was like, I don't know what I'm doing with my oh. life. So Kathy actually became my first client. Um, and I just kind of was faking it, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but Kathy and I worked together for quite a while and she was paying me and then she decided to quit her full-time job. And then she was like, I don't know how I'm going to pay you anymore. And I was like, well, I have all of these crazy ideas in my head and I'm a hot mess. Maybe we could just swap services. Nice. And so the, that's really where like our whole, I guess you would say business bestie status came from was that we both had a need and we decided to help each other out. So I ended up, you know, consistently bouncing ideas off of Kathy and she was helping me like be more organized in my thinking, which is still a lot of the structure that I run with today. So, I mean, this relationship has been amazing. Not only did we start a business together, but I learned a lot too. So, and then I guess on the flip side, I'm still really good at writing social media content. So. <laughs> yes. I love it. I'm a huge fan of, of bartering services. If you've, if, if I've got a skill that can help you and you've got a skill that can help me, I love doing that. I mean, it's awesome, right? Especially if you can look around and see. So here is Kathy with this, you know, by the way, I could use some of those idea implementation strategy things <laughs> because I have no shortage of ideas. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> so, but that's very cool that you help people, at least in that career, you helped people take the big ideas and the lofty goals and the thing and break them down and put them into tangible step-by-step -step to get the execution done. It sounds like, is that what it was? Exactly. Yeah. Nice. Very nice. I love it. I love it. And also too, the story about, um, striving to be the director, to find out that the director still didn't mean that it was your party, right? That it wasn't your mm -hmm. company, your, uh, your will to do what you wanted to do. We, you know, we talk about on the show, uh, fairly often about how not everybody, this is not, this is, you were cut out for entrepreneurship, but we, you know, I'm flipping it around the other way. Not everybody is, cut out for entrepreneurship and they shouldn't beat themselves up over it because for instance there's designers out there that love 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 the process of designing and they work for another company and then they think you know I'm doing all the designing they're getting all the glory and I can't get my final say and it's not my name on it and then sometimes they'll open up their own firm and find out that 
you know, where your boss was pressing you to be aware of the profit and loss of the different events and not to, I'm sure it was things like, don't throw that in and don't add this extra stuff because they're not paying for it and it doesn't matter. And yes, it would be better with it, but so what? That's not profitable for us to do. All of a sudden, when you get into your own firm and you realize that you're spending, you know, 70, 80% of your time on the business end of it and you're not doing the fun designing anymore. And when I'm working with some designers, sometimes I say, it's okay to work for somebody for your whole life if you're doing that task that you love so it's an opposite experience of yours but I think it's that same knowing what is the good thing for you and makes you happy do you agree I think so yes I think it's knowing where your passion is and knowing where you're where you're getting your fulfillment from Mm -hmm. and that and it's not necessarily like a lot of times we feel like success is this point in the future like when we hit that six you know that six figure earner or Mm. that you know that those lofty goals that society has deemed that this was what success means. Like when I wanted to be an event director, that was this point in the future that that's when I get to there, that means I'm supposed to be successful, but really you actually have everything you right now to be successful with what you have. And when you can determine that you are able to be successful with what you have right now, then all of those, you know, all those things that you achieve are so much sweeter because you're already successful. It's like, it's like the whipped cream and cherry on top. So this sort of reminds me when I was reading in your book about your brand pillars. And I feel like you have established your brand pillars for you as a company, but it, I can hear that it comes from your genuine belief system on what creates a happy, successful person, that it isn't all about the income. So do you want to tell us about what you have decided are your brand pillars for the Badassery brand? Yes, absolutely. And I think this is super fun because we had a meeting on Monday and we're shifting our business a little bit. And so we decided to create new brand pillars. So I just want everyone to know that, yeah, as you make shifts and changes, like these aren't set in stone, like you can knock down your building and build a new one. So, uh, (laughs) our, so our brand pillars right now, we, um, so brand pillars are really kind of, it's like what we talk about on social media. It's what we focus all our events on. It's kind of like our messaging, you know, in a sense, but it's really an essence of who we are. So our brand pillars right now are community and connections. Um, we're all about building really strong, powerful communities. And inside of those communities, we want people to connect, right? It's not a community that just like feeds our sales funnel. Um, and then our other brand pillar is we want to have fun and we want to show people kindness. So, you know, it's, if you ever worked yourself into a business or to a point in your business where you absolutely kind of hated it, <laughs> right? yeah, we want people to be aware that that line exists and that they can pull back and have fun. Because a lot of times when we start our own big dreams and we go after our own businesses, or, you know, you decide to become a designer, it's because you want to shift out of some point in your life that you're not enjoying. So remember to bring that also with, you know, the fun into the new thing that you create. And then we want people to also take action. So one of our pillars is to make an impact. So go out and take action. We don't care what it is. You know, if you want to volunteer, you want to start a nonprofit, or you just want to create a support system for other people, or you want to be the inspiration, whatever it is, just make an impact. And then our next brand pillar is really our events, which goes back to that community and connection. And then we also love to talk about travel and adventure. And it's not travel in the sense that we're, you know, now blogging about travel sites and we're (laughs) travel bloggers, (laughs) but it goes back to that getting out there and reaching new people and making that impact. Okay. And so translate this a little bit for us in shifting to thinking about an interior designer's business and career. And both of you are skilled at this, but obviously, Sam, you are the one who is more with the copy and, you know, the messaging and things like that. I shouldn't say that, obviously, but it seems like that's more, you know, you guys establish what your superpowers are, right? So the thing is, if we're talking to an interior designer Don't you believe, well, you you must believe that is as important for an interior designer to create community around their business as well, whether that community is real, if it's a brick and mortar community so that they're engaged in the local PTA or the Chamber of Commerce, or it's virtual and they've decided to start a Facebook group like Colleen Prim did. She started a Facebook group for potential consumers. They're not a Facebook group for her peers as designers. It's for homeowners that she shares design and tips with. Okay. So thinking about 
the being experts in community, what are some of the, just give us some ideas. What are some of the pillars that it occurs to you that a design, and I know by the way, that it has to be authentic to each person, but just give us some help on that. If somebody's thinking, what would be a pillar for a design business, right? Yeah. So I'm really glad that you asked this because we actually were working with um, Dixie Willard and Rachel Moriarty when they developed that design and style club. Yes. And I know that I know that it shifted directions. So I actually helped them kind of establish what that community was and what they were doing with it. So the big thing for them in this particular instance is visibility. So mm-hmm. their thing is all about getting out and being visible, which I get is, you know, peer to peer, like they're helping other designers, but even like encouraging other designers to be visible then helps them be visible and get more business, you know? Mm-hmm. So I think visibility should be a huge pillar of a community. Whatever it is, is making sure that you're showing up inside of it. And then each designer we've noticed has like their own flair, obviously, right? A lot of it too should just really be embracing who you are. And, you know, if that's that you're this fun, quirky person, make sure that's part of your brand pillar. If you freaking love macaroni and cheese, talk about macaroni and cheese, you know, and because, because people are really going to be attracted to your messaging and your attitude, and that's, what's going to get them to hire you as a designer. So make sure that when you're building the community, that it is about you. Okay. Okay. So, so when you talk about if you love mac and cheese, we're talking about injecting your personality. So we do this through blog posts on our website. We can do this if we have Instagram. We could do it through Instagram stories if we have a Facebook page. But the reality is, is if you don't have any of those social media outlets, the very least you could do is do it through like blog posts on your website. Agreed? Agreed. Or just a Facebook post on your page, like on your personal feed. Yeah, everyone has a personal Facebook feed. Right, 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 right. And so we talk about embracing who you are and who you are could be lots of things, right? It doesn't have to be just, I love mac and cheese to your example. Um, well, and, and let's use Rachel again as an example, the scarves, right? That's Rach, right? The scarves are all about Rachel. And so now not only does all of her designer community recognize her for that, but her consumer facing community is all about like checking out what scarf she's got on and the outfit and, and really her whole personal style with the the necklaces and the colorful uh, clothing and so forth. That's that's what you're talking about, if that's who you are. But the somebody else could be, I don't know, I don't know, North Face wearing, you know, <laughs> Patagonia type yeah, person, right? And maybe you go hiking a ton. And so like you're always outdoors and like you're showing that off because people are going to be attracted to that and be like, oh, that's a real person, you know? Right. And what, and do we take that a step further? And are we expressing that? Say, let's use that example. Say uh, I'm a designer. I'm a huge outdoor fan. My weekends are spent with my friends or family almost always on a hike. And I share that in my social, in whichever way I do it. Does that like what, what I just got when I started to picture that designer, I feel like not only if that resonates with me, but then I feel like immediately my brain went to, and that designer is going to understand that I need a really good mud room with a great big closet there so that I can take my dirty, wet boots off every Saturday morning after my hike, right? Like, is that, that's how we're talking about this thing crossing just from who you are, but to how a client can imagine working with you. Exactly. And you're also going to see a lot of nature elements probably in their design as well. Mm, Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And so the big thing is, is that you just ask somebody to sit and think about what does represent you on all your different levels and really sit with that. Your book has a lot of exercises for this, right? It does. Yeah. 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 And do you find that Do you find that people, when they go through these exercises, whether it's in your communities and when you're working with them, that at first we tend to just get stopped and say, there isn't anything about me. I I don't know what it would be, right? People do that a lot. Uh, Kathy, what's kind of your insights on this? I, well, I kind of relate because there was a long time where I felt like I was really boring (laughs) and like I suffered from mediocrity like it was a disease and I think a lot of people feel that way because they know themselves so well it's not special right Right. Right. well those little things like we for when we wrote the book one of our brand pillars was wine (laughs) yes 
we it, we liked to talk about it because wine brings people together and that's very important to us in our community and it's like well what do you what you know what do you like about yourself what do you want to be known for mm -hmm. and because these brand pillars help you create consistency through your messaging and um, by always just knowing what kind of go-to topics you should talk about and that becomes what you're known for and so when you're thinking about your brand pillars think about things that you want to be known for and if you're having a hard time you're getting stuck on it then ask people ask your friends like what you know when you think about me what do you think about or ask your you know if your customers if when you think about me what do you think about what 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 am i known for and that can kind of help you determine what your brand pillars should be I love it. I love it. I know I can tell you this. I, I'm a broken record with Nicole Heimer from Curio Electro, and I am so sorry, but I just, when somebody is just so smart and really does what they do at such a level of excellence, I have to always tell everybody about them because I know that not every listener listens to every show, but Nicole Heimer said exactly what she said. She had a sentence. I interviewed her over a year ago. And the sentence that she said when we were talking about brand and helping a designer to figure out what their brand was, she said the same thing, suggested that you speak to clients and colleagues, but she said, say the sentence in your head, Sally Smith is the designer who, right? And that, that brings something to the end of that sentence. Every single person has something that they want that sentence finished out by and sometimes that's how you start to peel away at what it really is the true essence of you that you know so well as you said Kath but is is obvious to the rest of us when we know you right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah exactly yeah yeah I think it's interesting so so the thing is now let's shift a little bit so we understand that if we're gonna create a community we have to identify these things that are important to us as a community leader, right? What is our community going to be about? I love what you guys do in your book. You take the whole um, uh, analogy through hosting a party that you would not just throw a party and not know what the point is. And you even have the one analogy where in your 20s, sometimes you do have a party and you don't know what the point is. The point is just to have fun, right? And you don't mm -hmm. care if there's 20 strangers at the party and at the end of the night you're sitting with your three friends and all night long there was 40 other people and you didn't know 30 of them, right? But as you think about it from a business standpoint, hosting a community, putting together a community, you compare it to hosting a party and getting clear on what type of party, why are you having it, who are the people you are going to invite, what is the experience that you're going to create for the people you invite to the community. Tell us a little bit about this process. Well, have you ever been to like a really bad party? Yes. <laughs> Where you don't feel like you should be there? Um, we recently had this experience actually like, like where we were at an event and it was like no don't sit there that's for my people only and we're like but this is a big oh. event you know and we didn't feel welcome we didn't feel like we belonged there and honestly we were kind of pissed off yes <laughs> and it was like oh you can't have that you can't have a wristband and I'm like why did you invite us to this freaking thing you know we flew all the way out here for you to treat us like we're not good enough wow. and that happens a lot when you show up at parties is, you know, like the host doesn't want to talk to you. She's like, take your shoes off. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we've all been there. And so we really were like, this is exactly what it's like when you come into other people's communities is you want them to feel welcome. You want them to be like accepted. You want to be like, oh my gosh, thank you so much for being here. Cause you don't have to be here, you know, but right. I really appreciate you coming over and hearing what I have to say. And then the other thing we really like to compare this to is the fact that sometimes you show up at a party and all of a sudden you're like slapped in the face with like, a, we're going to pitch you and we want you to sign up for this special, <laughs> you know, you've been there. Right. Exactly. And you're like, this isn't oh. the party that I thought it was. Yes. I thought this was an actual party, not a sales pitch. Right. Yeah. And so we really would just want to take those same aspects and those same feelings and make sure people bring that into their communities where, yes, it's absolutely 100% okay to monetize your party in your community, but do it in a way that feels good. Like people want to be there. They want to hear what you have to say because you've made them feel so amazing to be there. Mm. So when we translate that to an interior designer who let's let's talk about the platform 
platform of Facebook for these purposes of the conversation, right? So if we translate that to an interior designer who would like to grow their business and put more clients in their pipeline through building a Facebook group, a Facebook community of potential consumers, the analogy there is don't have a Facebook group where every single time somebody comes in, you say, and I have a two-hour consultation, and I have a pain consultation, and I this, right? That's what you're talking about. That's that I invited you here to my community under the guise of I'm an interior designer and I'm here to help, but every time you show up, my help is something that I want to sell you. Am I on the right track with that, ladies? Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, what are some of your favorite colors? Like really just cultivating conversations. Right. So the idea is that, and that's why your analogy, creating it as hosting a party, is so nice because every, I think what it is, is it's sort of like what you said. Sometimes what we know so well, we we don't see. But then other times we look at something like building a Facebook community and our only experience with it is that we're thinking of it as marketing. And so we think of it strictly in terms of, okay, I get in here and market. I've got to get in here and market, right? As opposed to flipping the switch and thinking of it, I'm inviting people in to my design world to see what it's like so that they can see if I might be the designer that they would resonate with. And when they eventually have a project, they might hire me, right? Yeah. I can give you a specific example of this too. Good. Um, so like a little, so earlier in the spring, I was trying to figure out how to put a guest bed in my office. And so I took a couple of pictures in my office and I posted them in a design Facebook group. And I was like, Hey, what do you guys think about like a solution for putting a bed in here, but I still want it to look nice and feel more like an office. And, um, immediately, like one lady started helping me, giving me ideas and tips. And then I started getting attacked by other designers. Like you're just asking for free design advice. This is bullshit. Like this isn't how this industry works. And I just started getting like freaking attacked. And yeah. here's the thing is the lady who offered me my tips. We started like PMing and guess who I'm going to hire now. Right. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. I mean, and the thing is, so so talk a little bit more about that. You end up working with this other designer. Did you have the conversation with her too and express how you were, you know, jumped on by the others and a, a philosophical conversation go back and forth? Because you know you have some people out there that heard that and thought, yeah, she was just asking for free advice. And others that might be like, well, wasn't she asking? T tell me a little bit about that. It's so here's the thing is I don't think you can ever give enough value, right? If someone comes and they're like, Hey, you want to come over to my house and design my house for free? No, you know, but if they're like, Hey, what are your ideas on this and this and this? It's like, just go ahead and open up that conversation. And I've never had a problem with people overstepping their boundaries because I don't have this giant gate up, you know, and I'm not constantly looking for it. I'm like, sure. You need advice. Let me help you. And yeah, it was, um, it was in Rachel's group. So Rachel and I had an awesome conversation about it. So mm. Okay. Okay. I mean, the thing about it is, is that I guess what it is, is, is it's learning the distinction as a business person about when it is beneficial to you as a business person to share your expertise and your knowledge and when the line is that it's time to charge for it. Because there is a point. I mean, I, you know, we're podcasters, right? So I don't know if you're in any of the podcaster groups and so forth, but you know, we, when you're a member of a podcaster group, you can come into that group and you can say, I have no idea how to hook up Skype. And of course, you know, any person that's podcasted more than three episodes, it's like, really? Right. But what happens is there are always people that will come in and answer that question. And they're almost always people who, as their profession, they handle all of that for you at a fee. But I know for a fact that the more those professionals in that group give the free advice, it is exactly what you just said. I ended up hiring the person that does my back end specifically because of that, because I watched her on a daily basis come in and answer the most simple to the most complicated questions, expecting nothing back. It's basically marketing. And then, you know, there's a whole marketing 
um, principle out there that to be a giver in Facebook communities to establish your credibility and establish the know, like, and trust, and then ultimately you'll always get the person that says, yeah, I really don't want to ask 15 more questions on where the bed goes. Would you just come over here and, and design the room for me, right? Exactly. It- Yeah. And I think that you brought up a great point. We talk about this in our book as well is that value that you're giving it. It actually is kind of like an, you're an investing in your business when you give it. So Mm -hmm. you are establishing your expertise. You are establishing your no like trust factor because that's what's going to get people to be able to trust you enough to hire you and like you enough to hire you and even just know what you can do for them. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're saying like, well, I know the answer to that, but you can, I'm not going to tell you until you pay me. They, they don't have any precedent to go on. It's, it's like, you, you kind of need a little bit of a taste, right? Mm-hmm. When you go to the ice cream store, you're like, can I have a sample of that, please? It's the same type of thing. So if people don't realize what value you, you do have, you just keep it so guarded that you just will only give it away to people who pay, you're doing yourself a disservice by doing that. Right. And yes, you're not going to design their whole house for free. You're not going to even design their whole bedroom for free, but you could tell them, you know, oh, have you ever thought about, you know, this specific furniture piece? Or I've got, you know, I can tell you where you to go find a really cool rug that would look beautiful right there. You know, just some little, little tidbits mm-hmm. and then when they they realize that they're still a little bit over, it's a little over their head and they're still a little underwater and they still need some help, then they come back to you because they trust you. Right, right, right. And I I, I think it's, and look, we're not talking about going into someone's home, driving 45 minutes, leaving your studio, spending two hours and working for free. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about taking the time. And I remember, I'm trying to think about, Very early on in the podcast, in the first five or six months, I feel like I had a conversation with a designer who really developed a lot of uh, clients for her pipeline because she would, back in the day, you know, when blogging was really, really popular, of course, it's still always popular, but before Instagram and really before a lot of the Facebook community groups, where you interacted with the consumer were pretty much the two platforms were the higher level blogs uh, and also on house. House used to have the forums, right? I know back in the day I used to go in and people would say, you know, how do I put a drapery rod, blah, blah, blah. How do I use a bracket like this? And if you came in as the pro and shared your advice and your help and just, you know, you're not talking about a five page dissertation. You're saying, don't use that bracket there. It's going to fall out of the ceiling, right? Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden you You've got a dialogue and then all of a sudden, you know what, maybe you could just come and do the whole thing for me. Sure, I could, you know, right? And so it's, um, there's a fine line, but it's a worthwhile line. And the point is that if you're going to start your own community, in your own community, you have to be a giver. You don't necessarily have to give in somebody else's community. So those designers that were giving you backlash, you know, they didn't have to answer and they also didn't have to say anything. They could just say, think they don't agree with what was happening and stay out of it. But if you are going to develop your own party, right? If you're going to have your own party, you would never have your guests come to the party and say, well, you were supposed to bring the beer and the wine. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like you want to give them the gifts of your hospitality, correct? Yeah, I think that's the key is really the hospitality aspect of it. I mean, you're right. You wouldn't invite people over and expect like, oh, well, I thought you were going to provide dinner as my guest. You know, it doesn't work like that. Unless it is like a pre, like, unless you're throwing a potluck, then that's a, you know, it's a different story because you've set that expectation when you created the party, right? So it's the same thing. When you set that expectation, when you set up your community of what is, what it's about, what's the purpose, what, how do the people kind of interact and, and create that, um, expectation and then people can show up and and have fun and be you know Mm -hmm. enjoy the community that you've created for them yes i know that colleen prim she started her facebook community in the summer beginning of the summer of 2018 and she she did it organized in the way i'm going to try and recall the different but each day has a theme so for instance monday i believe was she shares a tip 
Uh, maybe Monday is a tip and she answers questions or Monday she shares a tip. Tuesday she answers questions. I remember Wednesday was shop local. I don't recall what Thursday was. Friday, I believe, was work, uh, behind the scenes work. And so when you break this down, here she is every Monday sharing an interior design tip for free with her community right no different than a stranger coming into a community and asking for a design tip she's but she's proactive she's the hostess of this party and she's saying you've taken the time to come to my facebook community let me show you my love and appreciation back let me f- make you feel welcome like you guys said let me f- make you feel like it's a fun place to be because every monday i'm going to give you a tip on design and and then on wednesday when she does the shop local she does a live facebook video or recorded I don't know which but she goes to her you know countertop guy or her you know kitchen cabinet designer or she goes to the paint store and or she goes to the stone yard and another person might say well if you're going to give away a design tip every Monday 52 weeks of the year somebody like why would they hire you or if you're going to tell them where all your sources are they're just going to cut you out but the point is that we always know that people love to know how you do it. They want to know that they can trust you to do it, but they, they sometimes they just rather hire you to do it. Correct. Definitely. And what she's doing there is number one, she's providing value with giving information. I and mean, that's kind of like feeding your guests. That's how we kind right? of do the analogy in the book is, you know, you got to feed your guests. Right? right. And then number two, she's creating consistency. So mm-hmm. people know what to expect if they, like to come and they like to listen to the design tips, then they'll know to show up on Mondays. If they like to go watch her live streams at, you know, at the different suppliers around, they'll show up on Wednesdays. And it's creating that consistency that helps to develop that community. And then, I mean, it's also, there's some entertainment value in it as well, because mm-hmm. there would, if, if people didn't like to watch that stuff, they didn't like to learn design tips, if they didn't like to see the behind the scenes, there probably wouldn't be, you know, networks like HGTV because <laughs> <laughs> it's very entertaining and you almost create this like personality brand when you're doing that. And that's really, not only does it help market your business, but that's how you get the loyal fans. That's how you get the loyal people that will come to hire you before anyone else when they're looking to de- redesign their home. That's it's that personality right. brand that you've created that creates that loyalty. And the good thing is we've heard others on the show, Claire Jeffer comes to mind, and others have done it. I'm sure it's happened for Rachel as well, and I'm, she's probably said it to me in person or on the show. But when somebody is watching you every week do your thing on Facebook or IG stories or Instagram TV or wherever you choose to do it, YouTube, wherever you choose to do it, what they've expressed over and over again is by the time – they actually make the appointment and you ring on the doorbell, they feel like they know you already. It's, you know what I'm saying? They're, hi, hi, Claire, hi, Colleen, hi, come on in, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. We get that all. We get that all the yes. time too, and it's kind of, it's it's kind of surreal in an aspect where like you've never really met the person before. Mm-hmm. But then again, it's also kind of like, yeah, you, you do feel connected to them, mm-hmm. even though you've only met virtually. And, and I, I think that's one of the really cool things about the world we live in now is that everyone can be that connected without really being that connected, you know? Right, 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 right. So you're experiencing the same thing that I experience. And, and this is what we're trying to share with the designers is that I, I make the connection, you make the connection through podcasting, th- you, you through your community. And it is true. When you go to a live event, there are designers that every single live event come up to me and say, hi, Luann, I'm so-and-so on Instagram or I'm this. And then my, you know, my brain just goes, whoa, yeah, hey, we've talked. You know what I mean? It's like you do feel like you know them you do feel like it and so the point is that for an interior designer that's a tremendous leg up because now that first conversation in person that first consultation 
it, it, it relieves and removes a lot of that getting to know you and the dancing around each other space. You have an immediate connection. And so that's a good, powerful um, m- m- argument for starting a Facebook community if you're inclined to do it. So now let's take a few minutes, okay, to talk about the reality of having a community, the you talked about the consistency, some of the things that are okay. If you it's if you want to go into this, please be aware it isn't all fun and games. It's sort of like the most amazing dinner party that you've ever went to. By the time you get there at seven p.m. and the table is gorgeous and the flowers are there and the food smells terrific, you know the kitchen behind the door is could look like chaotic or even just the five days to get you to that beautiful moment. So talk to us a little bit about the things that we need to think about that we need to do that are maybe not so fun or not so easy or not so obvious in order to have a well-run community? You have to consistently show up. And sometimes that takes planning and that does take a lot of like effort on your half. But you just have to like show up and you have to constantly, you know, be posting if it's online you have to be like creating events for people so that is kind of some of the back-end work that it does take to run a community is you are like kind of on point a lot right it's a lot of work i mean again if we use the example of rachel's group uh, rachel and dixie and now rachel's group you know i'm aware of the different challenges that she's had for designers and different things you just don't like wake up on tuesday and go let's throw a challenge in there because you have to monitor the challenge you have to explain the challenge you have to right it's 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 like everything else it becomes something that you need to to develop a system and a process around Yeah. And I can tell a lot of people are probably like, oh my God, I feel so overwhelmed already, but that's really not the point of it. (laughs) It's, you know, and in the book too, we talk about it a lot, like saving time and it can be like batching things out or eventually you can even get someone else to post the things for you, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, this is what I'm going to do today. I want you to like go out and execute it. But you know, when you're first starting out, you have to bootstrap a lot of stuff. And Mm so really while a community might seem like a lot of work, you're going to get a lot back. So we always talk about this value exchange, like the amount of value I put out, like it needs to come back somehow. So it needs to come back monetarily or, you know, even just in the feel goods that really lit my soul up. So when you're building these communities, you get a lot back from it. You will get business. You will see a monetary exchange somewhere happen. You know, Mm -hmm. it's hard to say exactly where, just like in traditional networking, you go out and you meet all these groups and eventually someone who knows someone who knows someone hires you right so it's kind of that same philosophy around it like it's just a really smart way to run your business plus when you're doing it online too you're casting a really wide net and you can reach you know billions of people versus just like the few people that you might happen to meet so the while it might seem like a lot of work the reward on the backside is really high Hmm. And the, and the thing about it is, tell me if you agree, you guys are very good at creating an awesome party that everybody wants to be at. You have a very loyal, engaged, thriving community. The reality is, is that it is a job. It is what you do. You devote X amount of hours a week to it. Uh, you do it with intention. You do it through a system and a process and you enjoy it. There's a part of it that you like doing. And If a designer is listening and it feels like something that they would like to do and like and would enjoy doing, then full head, do it and do it with intention. But I, you know, if it's not your cup of tea, there's no reason to do it, right? Because you can't phone it in. Is that right? Do you agree? Yeah, exactly. So if you absolutely hate it, you hate being there every second, please do not do it. Yeah, because you could just can't phone it in because it won't work the same way. It just uh, it won't work for it won't result in the monetization that you're expecting it to in two weeks, two months or two years. It's just not going to happen because it's just like anything else if it's not real for you. And the point is that there's other things that you can do for your business if this isn't one of them. The, the reality is, is that we we all talk about all the options that we have, but we have to sift through and pick the ones that feel right for us. You agree? Exactly. Right. Okay. All right. Now tell me once we have our community here. So for instance, I'm going to use Colleen as an example again. Colleen was not interested in having people all over 
the U.S. or the world in her Facebook group. She intentionally wanted people in, I don't recall the radius that she set out, but I think it was something as small as 50 or 70 miles, okay? And so she went about inviting the people from her local PTA Facebook group and her local Chamber of Commerce, whatever groups that she was in that were truly local to her area. She went in and said, hey, I'm a designer. I'm starting this Facebook group. I'm going to be sharing tips and ideas on design and decorating. If you think that's valuable, you'd love to know that. Please come join. Okay. Now, other designers who offer e-design, they certainly could open it up to the world, as you said, and reach people all over. But tell me about some of the things that you do that you can share with us as examples of once we've gotten five, eight, ten, fifty people to join that are those host to see things that you do that make them feel welcome and start to get them engaged and feel like, oh, I was just checking out this community, but I like it here. Share some of those things that you do to make your members feel special and want to stay. Well, first of all, we set up kind of like a schedule, I, similar to what um, the the designer is doing in her group. We have a post that goes out daily. We mix it up a little bit. It's not always the same every single week, day of the, you know, like Mondays aren't always the same and Tuesdays mm -hmm. aren't always the, the same, but we do have some kind of initial engagement at the beginning of the day so that people can kind of, we, it, it's to get the, the conversation started and really it serves and it, it is, and it's lighthearted stuff. So it's not like, you know, getting really deep down into the issues or anything like that. It's stuff, it's things that people can participate in very easily. So like share your Instagram handle or, you know, drop a gif of how your day is going things that are like fun and that people want to participate and really that serves two purposes it gets people talking okay. <laughs> and having fun and it also kind of is is benefits your, the algorithms of facebook because the more engaged the posts are the more we're going to show up in people's feeds and so if no one is engaging on any of the posts no one's going to see our posts okay. so you it, it's kind of a it, it's very a strategic move on our part and then we continue throughout the day to post about different things so we'll post about um anything that's related to our five pillars. So we'll post about maybe like, um, we'll post about an upcoming event that we're having, or we'll, we'll post about some kind of cool thing that we did with our families, or we'll post about, um, you know, talking about how women interact with each other and connect the, anything that relates to those topics, those pillars. Mm -hmm. And then we'll also go through and, comment and respond and interact with people on their posts because we do have a lot our community is is very highly engaged and i think the reason for that is because we are a little bit less restrictive on what people can post in our group um, our rules are very simple we just have a don't be a dick rule <laughs> that's about it <laughs> pretty and straightforward it's, exactly we don't mess around so as long as you're being you know it doesn't fall under that rule then you're there you're good but um so it is very active but it also i mean we very rarely or we very rarely have had any problems with people you know overstepping that rule or breaking that rule and in, in fact i think we've only banned like two people out of the whole <laughs> the whole existence of the group which is awesome mm -hmm. so just having that a little bit more loose regulations on mm -hmm. the group um it helps us so we don't have to moderate it quite so much and um because if you have rules you have to enforce the rules right 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 <laughs> and right, then right. and then um it also because we have good um like i guess you could say we just good manners so to speak when mm. we do our posting people t tend to emulate that as well so i think it's just it's just making sure that there's a lot of giving and you're sticking to your pillars and interacting with other people in the group. And really you can like, you can schedule stuff in your groups. You don't have to do it all day, every day, right? You just, we schedule out all our posts to go out in advance. 
Um, and then we take some time every day to interact. And a lot of times we'll post kind of on the fly, like um, Samantha does tons of Instagram stories, um, sometimes that she'll share over in the group as well. And we'll take, like, I'll take pictures when I'm out with my family, those types of things that aren't so hard to mm. do <laughs> than write a sales, a sales post or something like that, that can right. be, you know, like, Oh, I don't know what to say on this without sounding so salesy. Right, 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 right. Okay. So some of the common pitfalls, like you alluded to them, there's when people are quote unquote, like you said, breaking the rules in a group. So for instance, I'm trying to think of some of the potential things that could happen in a designer's group. So something could be designer has a Facebook community and maybe the tile guy that she uses comes in and is like, hey, I'm having a sale on tile on Tuesday. Everybody come over. So that could either be okay with the designer or not okay with the designer, depending on her relationship with the tile guy, right? And so I usually the groups that I'm in, you'll, they'll say, okay, it's toot your horn Tuesday or tell us about your business Thursday. And that's your one chance during the week to go ahead and tell everybody about your business. And so the thing about it is, is what do you think about that? Do you, in your group, is it, you just don't care. People can share their business if they want to, or they don't want to, or, um, that's not the forum for that. Or th tell us those parameters. We don't care. You don't care. <laughs> we don't care. Yeah. Uh, I think people should absolutely share when they want to. And when we start putting like those restrictions on it, it's like all of a sudden we're restricting people's voices. Like maybe they were really excited to talk about their business, but they're like, Oh my God, it's not Friday at noon. I better shut up, you know? Right, right, right. Or, oh my gosh, I had this really cool experience, at, but it's not Tuesday and I can't share my experiences today. I mean, that's okay. just ridiculous. And do you feel that because it's not restricted, people don't overstep it and just are every single week like, hey, buy for me. This is what I do. Hey, buy for me. This is what I do. You know, we have a couple people like that, but what you'll notice with those people is they're not getting the interactions and the engagements that Everybody it takes. Everybody ignores them anyway. Yeah, to build a true business, so. Yeah, yeah. It's like in real life, that person that's at every network meeting that comes up and talks about them, you're like, whatever. Okay, all right. So that's interesting because I think that, I mean, I, I, I don't know that I've ever done that in any group when they said it's, you know, your day to say your business. I'm just like, what? This is, you know, this is your group. This is where you get your business. I'm not worried about that here. You know what I mean? But I'm also, I'm, I'm a little different. I don't know. I just... I don't know. I'm old school. <laughs> so, but I do know that that is, these are some of the things that you have to think about. The idea is to think about beforehand what is okay and what is not okay within your group because your group is loose and it's open and that's the way you view it. But that doesn't mean that's the only way to view it, right? As somebody else might be, I don't want sales pitches in my group every day of the week. I think that's exactly right. I, I think that, you do have to determine what is right for your group. I know that we have um, a friend of ours. In fact, he's our attorney and um, has a group. It's a, a, that he's a lawyer. And so it's people who like are getting illegal tips from him. Not, you know, not in like super legal tips, but right, right. <laughs> within, <laughs> within the ones he can share, you know, legally. Mm -hmm. And he restricts people from posting in his group. So no one can post in his group, but him. And which when I first heard about that, I'm like, what, why would you have a community and not let anyone post in it? What, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. Well, it, when he does that, if he, if he lets other people post in his group, it just opens up this whole huge can of worms because everyone is asking for legal advice on specific mm -hmm. questions that he really can't answer and there's all these other like confidentiality and he's not their attorney that sort of thing that comes into it and when I found out I'm like oh that makes really great sense then <laughs> like you may that's good, good I'm glad that you decided to turn off that you could you can be the only one that posts so he'll start conversations and people comment on his posts and he's got a re really active group but he's the only one that posts in it. So if you have a specific, um, like it, it's all about who's in your group. Like our group is full of business owners. 
So yeah, and our purpose is to help people grow their businesses. So it doesn't make sense for us to restrict people from talking about their business because that's why we started our group, <laughs> that's right? <your> mission. <laughs> exactly. So if you are, um, if your group is focused on is you know consumer focused, and you have all of these you know potential customers in your group it's probably, you probably don't have to worry about having a rule that they can't talk about their business because they probably won't because they're not, you know, it's, a, it's about design. And, and if you do have other designers join your group to try to poach your people or what, whatever, you can decide what those rules are in advance and mm -hmm. you can decide whether or not you even let other people in your group and it's all you're in control it's, right it's right, your right. Group. it's your group can i ask you a question a technical question is it possible to because what i'm thinking about is the vendor that takes advantage of the designer that's what i'm thinking about and i'm sure there's one bad apple for a hundred vendors but when I think about it, I think about here I am, I'm a designer, I've got a Facebook group, I want to allow people to post because I want them. I, I, my advice isn't bound by me being a lawyer, right? So they can say, how high should I put the drapery rod? And as a designer, I could say it should be here, right? But I would not want other vendors, the kitchen cabinet guy, the window treatment person, the tiler, the plumber to be constantly coming in and selling because then it changes the environment of my community, right? But I might invite these trades in in order to have them share their expertise and have them, you know, answer some of the questions that I can't answer and really create value for my consumers. So do I have it as a private arrangement? And I say, look, you can come in this group, but you can't pitch yourself. Or can I restrict certain people at, on their entry into the group as not being able to post, but only be able to comment? Or is it all people can post or all people can not post? I think when you start putting those kind of restrictions and stuff on it, that's when your time is like out the window and you no longer will love that community. Right, 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 right. Okay. Okay. All right. I just, I'm always looking for the things that are going to be the things that drive us right crazy that we, you know, we talk about all the happy stuff when we have <laughs> experts like you come on, like, this is great. Do this community. And it's sort of like, what's all the bad stuff that could happen. Right. So, and sometimes I get too nudgy into it. I hear me. I hear me. Okay. <laughs> One thing you could also do though, if like a vendor wants to come in and talk about their title, it's like, well, then they can purchase some sort of sponsorship from you and you can essentially rent out your community to them. Mm, right. You can do a F Facebook live and have them uh, pay you to do it or something like that. Or you could do a, vi they could put a video in and, and then you say it's a sponsored thing. Exactly. Right. Right. That's like some of my, I have episodes like that here on the show when a vendor wants to come in and not teach us a business lesson, but strictly pitch us their product. And I say, okay, that's a commercial. You can buy it even if it's an hour long commercial. Right. And so that's transparent to everybody that that's exactly what that is. And that's fine. And of course, in the doing of it, there is value exchanged for your audience, whether it's a podcast audience or a Facebook community audience. But um, the idea is that we're not pretending that it's something that it's not. It is basically somebody trying to express their services to you. Okay. All righty. All righty. Anything we left out in all of this conversation, ladies? I think we hit a lot of things in this conversation. <laughs> yeah, great conversation. <laughs> okay. All right. So now just give us a rundown. I said that you have the Badassery Magazine, you have the podcast, you have the book, and you have the communities. Give us where we learn more about you. And um, if people are interested in joining the communities, tell us a little bit about those before I let you go. So if you just head over to badassery mag, it's mag.com, you can seriously find out what city we're going to be in next, how to join our communities. You can even, you know, submit articles for us to publish. So it's a really cool little hub and you can, you know, find all our handles. We're at badassery mag everywhere. Okay. And you just said something there. You can submit articles to publish in your magazine. What topics, what, what's the angle? What do we, what do you want? What are you looking for? Anything that's your area of expertise and lights your soul on fire. 
That's pretty broad there. Okay. So if somebody, <laughs> somebody wanted to submit an article on why I became an interior designer and it's particularly interesting story or my latest project was such a challenge and I overcame it in this way. These are to- viable topics? Absolutely. And we've published things just like that. Okay. Okay. And that's interesting. So would they go to badass, com to find out all of this? Exactly. All righty. All righty. So you guys are pretty awesome. I really do thank you so much for coming on the show today. And I just want to remind everybody that the companion shows that would go with this would be the Colleen Prim episode. And also we talked about Rachel Moriarty and Dixie Willard, and they've been on the show. And we have Nicole Heimer. And you can go to LuannNigara.com and go on podcast tab, go to all episodes and put their name in the search bar and you will come up with the episode. I would tell you without question, if you are interested in having your own badass community that definitely go over and see what Kathy and Samantha are up to join their community and then definitely take a listen to Colleen Prim's episode because that whole conversation is completely relating this big concept to a specifically how an interior designer is executing it and earning money and earning clients through it. So thank you ladies so much for joining me. I do appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks thanks so much for having us. Thank you so much for joining me again today. This podcast is a production of Window Works, your resource for custom window treatments and awnings. To learn how we can help you on your next interior design project, go to www.windowworks-nj.com. And if you're interested in working with me on your business, either through masterminds or one-on-one coaching, or you want to know how to get my book, The Making of a Well-Designed Business, or you just want to know what's going on in the podcast land, and where I'm going to be. All of that is found at luannnigara.com. Thank you so much. Have an excellent day.